from Germany and has most of his formal training there and his credentials start to get pretty hot by the fact that he came here on a fellowship, Fulbright Fellowship, which are very difficult to come by, and uh, did some postgraduate work at, at uh, uh, BPI, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, and then we acquired him and, uh, in the full sense of the word, and we're very pleased with that. Um, as a personal note, my credentials are in systems, and so uh, Uva and I have much in common, even though I have participated in systems building, I must admit, however, that Uva knows a hell of a lot more about systems than I do. His uh, research in building systems throughout the world are far more thorough than the kinds of things that I've done. So we come at this thing from a systems approach to the problem. Um, in addition to this, Uva and I have discussed the, one of the most significant problems with systems is that frequently they are without human value or the human characteristics are lost in them. And that one needs to take a look at any technological innovation that we use in our country, in our built environment, to make certain of its relevance. Our legislation, all of our legislation, based on three factors relative to the human the constituent, health, safety, and general welfare. And so it's a relationship then between the technological aspects of systems, the systems approach in its very broadest sense, together with its response to human requirements, that I am real pleased to introduce Uva Kohler to respond to. adequacy of our present building practice and its 
governing codes and standards. Two, particularly in response to the 1971 San Fernandino Valley earthquake, which was close, as you might recall, to Los Angeles, the American Institute of Architects is presently involved in preparing a primer on earthquake resistant design. I had an opportunity at the last AIA convention to uh, discuss this particular document, and I think that is a very good sign that the AIA is responding uh, to fill a gap. And third, the impact of new demands of OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, on our profession is generally not fully understood. Recent horror movies uh, like Towering Inferno and Earthquake generated additional public and also professional interest. Last year's tornado disaster of April 3 and 4, which seriously affected our state and the whole Midwestern region, made it painfully clear how inadequate many of the buildings are, which we design, build, and use. Major architectural journals are starting to devote more attention to the topic of life safety. For example, Progressive Architecture devoted her whole April 1974 issue to the topic, and the mid-August 1974 issue of Architectural Record on Engineering devotes much space to design for life safety. I predict that life safety and new advances in this field will be almost as important as a response of our profession to the energy crisis. If we examine building with the systems approach in mind, and I think I don't really have to explain this, uh, Bill did a very good job to emphasize the importance of the systems approach to problem solving. Uh, then we will find that many design features which help to conserve energy might also help to increase life safety. I would like to make some general remarks. Then I would like to describe more fully what life safety encompasses. And finally, I will talk on our college's involvement in tornadoes and how they affect the design work of the architect. I would like to show you some slides uh, to help to explain what I'm trying to say. Tapanta Ray is what you're reading in the center. It's Greek. Somebody said it more than 2,000 years ago, and it means everything is in flux. The person said it was Heraclitus, and he said it when he sat at a river and watched the water flowing. You cannot step in the same river twice. Architecture is changing over the decades and centuries, responding to changing socio-economic and cultural patterns. Also changing over the years is an individual's interest in various facets of architecture. When I started to work as an architect, I had design, uh, besides, of course, design work in various fields, including a really most exciting work in uh, preservation. I had an opportunity to work at the building site. In 1965, I wrote specifications. And actually, as a matter of fact, when I started and I got this assignment, I said, you know, I just you know, don't believe it. Uh, I would like to design and do all these exciting things. And they told me, uh, well, you'll feel, find out it is uh, very useful. And I agree. Writing specifications uh, can really require quite a bit of creativity. And uh, the specification writer 
really has to understand a lot. He can mess up a design or he can even help to emphasize and help the design architect to express what he wants to do. So I wrote specifications for Max Tarts Children's Hospital in Berlin and supervised the construction. Uh, Max Tart was very closely related to uh, the Bauhaus and uh, died a couple of years ago. Interesting person. Um, my particular interest was involved here in this uh, auditorium of the Children's Hospital. And uh, at that time, prefabrication was really quite a new issue, particularly used in uh, housing in Europe. So uh, I wrote the specifications in a way that it could be either built conventional or prefabricated. And I was really happy to see that uh, a construction firm uh, did a prefabricated system for it. University in Berlin by Candlis, Josic, and Woods. Uh, this building right here on the left uh, is the most innovative design for a university building, utilizing prefabrication and featuring something what I think is most important a very large degree of flexibility. job as a private consultant, I consulted with a client and to the architect and tried to organize it. was it is a two hundred million dollar project to coordinate the architectural planning and the construction phases. What I'm trying to make is a point uh, about my interest in systems and systems approach. When I came over to this country I pursued my interest in industrialized building was involved in proposal for Operation Breakthrough and evaluated that. Operation Breakthrough, this nation's effort to industrialize housing. My general interest in systems approach really sort of branched out when I uh, won a scholarship to attend a summer institute at the University of Washington on what was called multi-protection design. I was particularly attracted to this summer institute because they were emphasizing the systems approach. So based on this work and this experience, I work professionally in this field uh, in a consulting capacity to a number of architects in uh, Vienna, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And finally, after April 3, I was actively engaged in tornado research. To put all these things together, I had an opportunity to organize a workshop for EDRA, the Environmental Design Research Association. And uh, so we had quite a successful workshop on life safety in, in environmental design. Architectural practice is a lot of things. You have to respond as an architect to codes and standards and other regulations. We have overlapping codes. We see some few here in the center. Uh, we have OSHA. We have always new regulations. Things are changing rapidly. Fire traditionally was one of the major concerns of building codes. Uh, as I said earlier, we are really involved in the rethinking process. Are our codes still adequate? Uh, one of the items which was most important in this rethinking process is the report America Burning of 1973. When you have your license as an architect, that means that you are qualified as an architect and knowledgeable also in the field of life safety and application of codes. You are liable for the building. You are liable for the safety of the occupants to a certain degree. Uh, I tried to get uh, the license of this gentleman on the right. And I wrote these people.
but they said, well, actually he doesn't have one. Those who haven't seen the movie uh, Towering Inferno, that of course this is the hero, the architect in that movie. And I'm just showing you very quickly some very few slides. Uh, High-rise buildings pose a lot of problems. Uh, we had quite a few fires, as I had mentioned in the past, and uh, I think that really depicts what can happen when you are trapped in, let me see, maybe if you go back in one of these slides, we have these outside elevators, and you realize this building is burning, and you are looking down, and you know, whatever you see are flames, and you saw, let me point this out, I think the architect is zero. Get out of the building when you are uh, in a fire, is the main problem you have to solve. You have to prevent it, and then to provide adequate means of egress. Let me not go too much into uh, these charts here, which show two points right here in the center. Safety to life limitation, uh, fire characteristics, construction, and firefighting are just some few of the components. Yeah, I was just emphasizing the exit requirements. And the chart here in the center, uh, various implications of specification codes, component performance codes, and goal-oriented system performance is pointed out. Earthquakes. Geophysicists attempt to describe and to analyze the movement of the Earth, the building of mountains, the apparent drifting of continents, volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. Planet Earth is believed to consist of various mantles or layers of different consistency. We have the crust, which is between actually three and five miles thick under oceans and up to 30, mi 30 miles thick in other regions. That is a relatively thin crust at the base of the mantle and I'm not talking even about the inner core we have unbelievable pressures up to 11,000 tons per square inch at the base of the mantle and that is important for earthquakes uh, we have temperatures uh, of about 10,000 degree Fahrenheit temperature and pressure differentials cause movements. Under stress, solid rock, the solid rock of the crust, uh, normally deforms plastically. However, if high strains builds up along the forms, it is causing horizontal and vertical motions. We have an energy release. We have earthquakes. The elastic rebound theory established in uh, 1906 by Harry Fielding Reed uh, describes phenomena, phenomena as follows. A strain is accumulated along forms. Rock becomes disturbed but holds in the original position until accumulated stress overcomes the resistance of the rocks. The earth snaps back into an unstrained position. The sliding of the rock creates shock waves or earthquakes. So we have here this, the description in the center of movements. We have displacements in two directions, horizontally and vertically. And uh, for instance, the slippage at the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco was 20 feet. 20 feet. You know, if you're standing sometimes and uh, things starts to slip, you really need to make a big step. Uh, we have two types of waves, the so-called P and the S wave, that is described here on the right-hand side. Uh, the center of most earthquake activities is really in the upper mantle of the crust, right here, the upper mantle of the crust. We call this the hypocenter, 
when we project this to the surface, surface we have the epicenter, and we see as a P or horizontal uh, primary wave and the secondary wave. These waves move in an incredible speed of about the P wave about four miles per second, the S wave about one half of that speed. Earthquakes, quirks, quakes are uh, a major occurrence worldwide. We see here in the Pacific the so-called ring of fires. The Pacific coast of the United States is part of it. Also extremely active is the so-called Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Uh, here on this particular chart, we see various major earthquakes associated uh, risk maps. The largest uh, recorded earthquake here in the United States, as a matter of fact, took place in New Madrid, not far away from our area, in 1911 was one of the greatest in recorded history. Uh, a large area in uh, Arkansas and uh, Missouri is called the Sunken Country. Now let me just uh, very briefly run through. Here we have an example of the 1971 earthquake in uh, Los Angeles, the Olive View Medical Center. At that time, brand new, built in 1970, 850 beds, $23.5 million dollars. At that time, designed at current, current at that date, current building codes. The earthquake took place in the early morning hours, and it is really a miracle. Only three people died, two of them due to power failure, because uh, they were in what happened? Uh, well, you get a general impression, I guess. You saw particularly. I'm sorry. The stair towers collapsed. Can you imagine? People would have been in the stair. Could you have imagined? People would just have walked by. Could you imagine? A fire would have broken out. Disasters don't come along, as a saying. The reason was they are simply wrong designs. The architect pulled them on very elegant stilts, these stair towers, instead of bringing down the wall, which would then really act as a sheer wall. Just an example of what happened here the first floor, which was unoccupied. That's where all the therapy happens. If people would have been there, well, uh, I think this was really almost lucky what happened during this earthquake disaster in 1971. There was, for instance, a reservoir and the dam almost failed. The flood could have killed more than 100,000 people living in this particular valley. There is a negative uh, aspect of systems approach when I say disasters never come alone. Noise, one other environmental threat. Most important in our technological age, one of the sources, transportation, industrial activity, equipment. You know, it's difficult to hear sometimes in this room because of air conditioning makes noise, the refrigerator at home, and so forth. Audiologists have studied Aborigines, and in their finding, they uh, found the following thing. Hearing is much superior uh, in Abor Aborigines uh, than that of men in our technological environment. Recently, much attention is given to men, environment relations, or, profession or uh, environmental psychology, and there's a real need to do something about things, including about noise. The architect can do something about it. Mechanic equipment, there are design strategies to 
contact us to take care of this. Crime. Major problem of our time. Various types, one of them is vandalism. Oscar Newman in his book Defensible Space, uh, based on a study by his New York City uh, Institute of Planning and Housing, uh, came to astonishing findings. How we design our buildings very seriously affect, affects the safety and security of their occupants. Harry Reese built this uh, Lake Michigan College in Benton Harbor, and he really made it a fortress. It's very difficult, it's good in terms of safety. As a matter of fact, this really has also a number of other potentials. It's good for NATO shelters, and uh, uh, it's good in terms of energy conservation, and various other things. Uh, it is also good in terms of fallout shelter, because the fallout will stay on the surface of the lake, so the minimum, uh, there will be a minimum of exposure in case of something what is still with us, nuclear attack. It can be all over the country uh, when we have a, an explosion or maybe a failure of a nuclear reactor to a tornado wave. Which my actual topic of today. Uh, it can be all over the country. design strategies for uh, the disasters and hazards I just described can be also good for this man-made disaster, nuclear radiation. Energy conservation. I'm showing here a project uh, for uh, GSA, the federal building in Saginaw, which very much focused on energy conservation, but as a byproduct of almost have various other features uh, for life safety. We can really talk about something like a synergistic effect, according to Buckminster Fuller, sometimes one plus one is not two, but might be two point five or even three. We have not only to design for the average person, but also for the sick handicapped and the young. Tornadoes are local atmospheric storms of short duration front of winds rotating at high speeds in three meteorological conditions. And we had almost most of them last night. Those who woke up or were still awake at 2.30 last night, they were pretty close to an unseasonal tornado. We need, however, three conditions. We had two last night. A low level layer of moist warm air, supported by an upper level layer of cool dry air. Second, narrow bands of strong winds and both levels. And finally, and we didn't have this last night, a triggering mechanism. Tornadoes are, uh, let's call it, uh, induced rotary circulation of winds. Different types of tornadoes, different wind speeds, and you have seen uh, in the slide before the six categories uh, on the Fujita scale from zero to five. You can talk about the mini tornado, medium, maxi tornado. Wind speeds range from uh, 125 miles to an excess of 300 miles per hour and associated with it we see various features in terms of length, in terms of intensity and so forth. And what's most important in terms of warning chances. Risk. Without going into the statistics, when we examine it we will find that according to area, Indiana is almost the leader in terms of incidence per area, so-called degree square, which is a statistical unit described in this particular slide right here, and in terms of death from tornadoes. It's dangerous to live in Indiana. It was 
was particularly dangerous last year, April 3, 1974. Uh, we had a so-called jumbo tornado outbreak of more than 100 tornadoes, which devastated not only our state, but also really the whole Midwestern region, as you can see in the slide on the left-hand side. These are the tracks of the major tornadoes. Uh, together with Professor Monk and Luis Morales, uh, Solberger, Paul, and Schrötzinger, we got in a helicopter by the National Guard and took a look at things. That was the beginning of my research on uh, tornadoes. Here we see the tracks within the state. We flew over all of them. You see the number of dead, 48 injured. A large number of houses was destroyed. The jumbo tornadoes in general generated altogether 313 deaths, injured almost 32,000, made 13,500 homeless, and resulted in property damage of approximately $500 million. So, you see a Professor Monk on the back, that's in senior, and Morales. Uh, so, a helicopter and the state patrol flows around there. If you take a look here on the right hand side uh, from the helicopter and see senior. Right, right through downtown. Actually, it was a series of tornadoes. What you see in the center is a school building. They had just scheduled a dinner for 600 people at 6 o'clock in this particular facility. Uh, the tornado struck a couple of hours earlier. So in case this building would have been occupied, you could have imagined what would have happened. The highest about uh, two, three miles away, you find further pieces of debris. That was the location of the new Southwark funeral home in front of the park. And uh, anyway, if you'd like to roll it, I would like to show you the movie of somebody up there. Yeah, here it is. The movie of the tornado, which almost hit Ball State University, just 20 miles away from us. Focus, please. Thank you. A little bit better. And actually, what you see on the slides on the outside, the left hand side is a simulation of a tornado, on the right hand side is very much what you see right here in this picture. It looks like one tornado, but actually it is a number of vortices, so-called suction vortices, rotating around the common core. And here you see the various tornadoes. Can you see them? particularly clear when you see the various vortices. You can recognize, if you're careful, five different vortices rotating around the common center. This particular, that is a very new discovery that Molly Hubbard, who is a reporter, was able to film this sequence it's of extreme importance. It helps us to understand what a tornado can do, and why we find sometimes that one house is destroyed and the next house is completely intact. It is due to the skipping action and the rotating configuration of the tornado. It was just about 240 miles per hour, and maybe our building would have survived it, but I'm not sure about the mobile home park next by.
excited. So what you see is really a movie of a movie. And uh, what uh, Dr. Fuchida, Mr. Tornado in uh, Chicago did, and I received the film on it, is to adjust uh, the horizon for better viewing. of the damage survey, uh, a number of publications was generated here recently, the uh, engineering aspects of tornadoes of the April 3 and 4 of 1974 by the National Science Foundation, publication on what's left after a tornado and the safest places in schools. And let me just flip through. Uh, all these things were done more or less in a teamwork with a group in Texas and in Detroit. And uh, I'm showing you now something out of the sequence of the safest place in schools. And let me just rush through it. A lot of things are really self-explanatory. Talking here about the different effects of winds. Wind, word, wall, failure, and examples. If you have openings in the wind, and you see how a roof can be lifted and you see all the pop knobs in the wall of that school in Montessori. You might recognize the school and see here. Uh, opening in Windward Wall, that is uh, about eight deaths were caused by the collapse of this ice curling ring in Windsor. Next to Detroit. One of the greatest dangers are flying missiles. You see some here and can appreciate the size. They come in different forms. And you see here what's left in the core area, short spans, but you see very clearly the dents of flying missiles. Collapse. To pressure differential, a building might just explode, as you can see here in this uh, rural building in the center. What you as an architect would like to de-emphasize in your design when you have native safety in mind are glazing, or glazing at the wrong spot, wrong spans, wind tunnel, all these things are not good in terms of wind resistance. All that glass you see in schools after the tornado really scares you. Wall bearing construction. Example for the wind forces. You see a little car here in front, and that is Monticello, the railroad bridge. The various girders were blown from their pilots into the water, and you can appreciate the size of the close up. Good features, lowest floor, that's where you would like to uh, uh, have the shelter. Short spans, interior spaces, frame construction. We analyzed in this study various schools, including Parker. And let me just rush through in the interest of time, I don't want to keep you here forever. Here in this hallway, school was also dismissed. 17 schools were affected here alone in Indiana. And uh, basically no serious injury, no death due to the fact that school had been dismissed at the time of the tornadoes hit. In this building here in Parker, uh, there was a group of teachers there and they, the students are at the right spot. 
right here where this person is standing. Not a cell off.
became pretty clear, I guess, from previous slides, that frequently what is left of houses is a core area. Nothing was left of the house in the center, also here in Parker, and uh, the occupant, a lady, Mrs. Rosengreen, uh, died. She was carried away a couple of hundred feet. She was found in the field. Uh, some houses have inherent shelters. And let me not go into the statistics, I promised you. Uh, as a next step, I am currently involved in a small research project to develop a tornado shelter within the single family house. And what I'm showing here are two sketches by Dale Saltberger who helped me last summer, which describes two possible approaches is to reinforce an existing uh, or uh, you know, a, a part of the building which is needed anyway, an interior part, and reinforced to protect adequate shelter from tornado events. Let me just sum up briefly. Uh, I think I made my point about life safety and since I see here a coffin in, uh, uh, in this picture, I think you as an architect would like to make sure that your client, or maybe you, don't end up prematurely in a container like that. It is exactly 4 o'clock and I made it within our time limit. Let me make just one closing remark uh, once I saw in Dave Bartle's office the slogan we still are looking for a few good men uh, let me add uh, women uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, this new course in spring which is not yet advertised and uh, some people are participating that you would like to take it, and there are some few spots open, so if you're interested, uh, Dale has some handouts. And let me just, uh, last not least, show you this item right here, which is a study, Tornado Preparedness Investigation for Ball State University, Independent Study Project by Dale Solenberger, Sora, and Paul. And uh, they found out, and Charlie, yeah, I see you there. You haven't seen it yet. We also analyzed the safety of our building and uh, various other buildings here, and I think they did a marvelous job in uh, finding out uh, about uh, tornado safety in, at Ball State.